Our sermon title today changed just a bit from what's in the bulletin. The title is Sing Praises to God, But Why? Let us pray. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight. O oh Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. The psalmist wants us to sing praises to God. Did you hear him? Did you hear Alice when she read the text? And for that matter, did you hear Susan when she sang the song, Oh, sing to the Lord a new song. For God has done marvelous things. The psalmist not only wants us to sing praises to God, the psalmist is actually commanding God's people. In his day, that was the children of Israel to sing praises to God. Pastor Keith Sirk once told me that I ask good questions in my sermons. And so today, my question is why? Why does the psalmist want Israel and why does the psalmist want God's people that includes us to sing praises to God? I mean, I know that God is worthy of praise. In other words, God does plenty of praiseworthy things, but surely God does not need our praise like a child or an adult for that matter who benefits from an esteem boost when receiving praise from teachers or parents or spouses or peers, surely God is not in need of praise. God doesn't need gold stars and applause. Surely God's esteem is not in need of affirmation. So why? Why is praise part of our faith practice? Why is praise often part of our liturgy? Why is praise part of the Old and New Testament scripture? There are nearly 250 commands or declarations to praise the Lord in the Old Testament and New Testament combined. And my question is why? Not trying to be funny or difficult. I'm not being sarcastic. I believe like for any sermon, the spirit was guiding me so now, that so know that I trusted the spirit as I prepared the message. I didn't have the concluding answer when I started out with why. What a journey it has been. And so as I followed the spirit, I asked that you do the same. I did pause, by the way, and check in and say, why, spirit? Are you leading me to ask why? Praise God. Maybe the spirit knows that some of us have this very question, why praise God? Maybe praise takes some of us out of our comfort zone. Maybe some of us choose churches that are not going to try to pump us up to praise God because we just don't do that sort of thing, that thing that we picture as praise. Depending on what our image of praising God is, praising God makes some of us uncomfortable. We don't do that here. We're not that kind of church. And if that is the case, we should be asking ourselves, if we don't do what the scripture seems to command us to do at, at, a lot, at least by one count, 250 times, what might that mean for us? I mean, are there ramifications for not doing what the sacred text says and even commands us to do? I think my question, why praise God, is central to all of these and other questions one might have. And so I sought the Lord for an answer to the question, why does the psalmist command God's people to praise God? Let's see if the text itself will answer the question. Sing unto the Lord a new song. Skipping down to verse four, make 
a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth break forth in joyous song and sing praises, sing praises to the Lord with lyre and with the lyre and the sound of melody. Did the psalmist want new songs for worship? Did he want people to seem more joyous? Did he frankly want more noise? I mean, I love a joyful worship service as much as the next pastor. I even love a joyful, noisy service every once in a while. But is this why we are commanded to sing? Or why would I encourage you to sing praises to God? Is there something psychological that happens when there is a noisy praise in church that causes us to forget our troubles for just a moment? Makes us feel better? No worries. I know that noisy service won't make all of us feel better. Is this the reason German sociologist and, and economic theorist Karl Marx theorized that religion is the opium of the people? That it induces a false and unrealistic sense of contentment among people? Was the psalmist trying to create a joyous worship to give a false sense of contentment and hope? I've wrestled with that theory and with the resounding no, our faith is not an opium and, and the purpose of praise is not to conjure up joy where there is none to make you feel better and to make the oppressed accept their oppression because at least God is good. I thought I'd get an amen right there. If we consider what it means to praise, we might come to an answer to the question, why? If I say, praise the Lord, in some churches there will be a response, praise the Lord. But that's simply a repeat of the command. Let me help somebody today. Saying praise the Lord is not praising the Lord. It's okay to say it, but you just join the, the voices that are asking others to praise the Lord. Let me illustrate. If I suggest to parent, you should praise your child. And let's say the child's name is Bobby. Should the parent go and say, praise you, Bobby? No, you're not going to say, Bob, you're not going to say, praise you, Bobby, if you're praising your child. You're going to say, Bobby, you're such a wonderful son. You are kind and thoughtful. You befriend those who are left out. You are generous with your toys and your lunch money. Those are wonderful attributes, and we are glad you are our son. Praising God is not saying praise the Lord. Praising God is recalling God's attributes, deeds, and acts that you've experienced or know to be true. The psalmist says, oh, sing to the Lord a new song for he has done marvelous things. God's right hand and God's holy arm have given God victory. The psalmist wants a new praise song written for the marvelous things God has done. This psalm likely written according to some scholars following God's deliverance of the children of Israel from Babylonian exile is encouraging the people to recall the new things God has done in these new times. And new things call for new songs. And in these ever-changing and ever-evolving days and challenges, I am confident that God is doing some new things in our lives. Oh, just the fact that we have a congregation in here, and we have a congregation on the screen, and we're all the same congregation, and there's even more people we're not even aware of who are paying attention and worshiping with us out there. God is doing some new things that we never imagined. 
And new themes calls for new praise, songs of praise that say, God, you are wonderful. You are holy. There is none like you. You do more for us than we can acknowledge, that we even acknowledge. And you keep on doing great things. Bless your holy name. The command to sing unto the Lord a new song is a call to praise God for the marvelous things God is doing in these extraordinary times. And I just wonder if anybody has a new song in their spirit for what God is doing in your life and in the life of the church. The psalmist knew that God had done some marvelous things delivering the children of Israel from exile in Babylon. And, and this command is a command to recall God's good deeds. And this is a pattern in the scriptures. There is a command to praise and then the reason for the praise. Like in Psalm 117, praise the Lord for his merciful kindness is great towards us and the truth of the Lord endures forever. Praise God for God's mighty acts. Praise God according to God's excellent greatness, Psalm 150. I will praise your name for you have done wonderful things, Isaiah 25. Praise the Lord for God has delivered the life of the poor from the hands of the evildoers, Jeremiah 20 and 13. And our psalm today, oh, sing unto the Lord a new psalm. For God has done marvelous things. God's right hand and God's holy arm have gotten God the victory. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Break forth in joyous song and sing praises. This isn't about making noise, conjuring up joy so the mood can be light for worship. Praise is about recalling the marvelous things God has done. Why? Because if we don't recall them, we might just miss what God is doing and we might think God is doing nothing. And there's more. We are commanded to praise by recalling the good deeds of God in order to give credit where credit is due. So that we're clear that the credit is due to God. Sounds like I'm making the same point, I know, but it's an extension of the first point. The first point of why praise is to recall the deeds of God so we don't miss it. The second is to give God credit where credit is due so that those who didn't do don't get the credit. There were earthly rulers and earthly kings in that day and in this day who would take credit for what God has done. Earthly rulers who controlled the masses so that God had to deliver the people from bondage of earthly rulers in ways that the people knew that was only by the hand of God. So the psalmist knew when amazing things happened that the people needed to give credit where credit was due so that the people were clear that was a move of God. And it wasn't man. That's why Psalm 29 too, and I love this, it says, ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. Psalm 96 repeats this, ascribe to the Lord. All you families of nations, ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due the Lord's name, bring an offering and come into God's courts. Ascribe to the Lord so that you are clear, people of God, that which God, not man, has done. That's a good spiritual practice. If you're looking for something to do throughout the week, ascribe to the Lord the glory due God's name. Ascribe to the Lord those things that you see that God is doing. Ah, but just like that four-year-old that keeps on repeating the question. Again, I ask why? 
If God doesn't need it, why are we commanded to praise? We are commanded to praise to recall the good deeds of God so that we don't miss the move of God. That's one. We are commanded to praise to give credit where credit is due to God and not to man. That's two. And we and as we recall the deeds of God and give credit where credit is due, we come to a greater knowledge of God. We'll come to know God's power, power to set the captives free. When you see the captives free, you can say that was God. I ascribe that victory to God to make every hill and mountain low, to make the rough places plain and, and to make the crooked places straight. Has God ever made a crooked place straight for you? You should affirm and, and ascribe that to God. We'll come to know God's power, but we'll also come to know God's provision. Provision, but there is an abundance all around us. It is man who holds up, rations out, stores up, wastes what God has provided. But my God shall supply all of your needs according to God's riches and glory, when we ascribe to God the good deeds God has done, we'll come to a greater knowledge of God. And we'll not only know God's power and provision, but we'll know, we'll come to know God's love. Nobody said it better than in the Gospel of John, for God so loved the world that God gave God's only begotten son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but shall have everlasting life. And this son, his name is Jesus. And we, when we ascribe to God the credit that is due for Jesus, when we ascribe to God that he sent one who would heal the broken hearted, when we ascribe to God that he sent one who proclaimed the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim the release of captives, recovery of sight to the blind and to let the oppressed go free. When we ascribe to God that he said to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, when we ascribe to God that God sent one who flipped tables in the temple to stop the exploitation of the poor. When we ascribe to God that God sent one who fed the people who were hungry and gave water to those who were thirsty. When we ascribe to God that God sent one who scattered the proud and bloodthirsty men who wanted to stone the woman caught in adultery, I still ask, where was the man? When we ascribe to God that God sent one who turned the woman at the well into a preacher in the courtyard. When we ascribe to God that God sent one who said, let the little children come unto me. And do not forbid them, for such is the kingdom of heaven, affirming children when otherwise they were considered like slaves. When we ascribe to God that he sent a savior who taught and demonstrated the commandment, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. When we ascribe to God that he sent a savior with a love ethic and not a hate ethic. A savior who knew abundance and not lack. A savior who empowered and did not enslave. A savior that gave and did not take. A savior who loved all people at the expense of his own life for the powers of the day crucified him. Laid him in the tomb all night Friday and Saturday and early Sunday he got up with all power, resurrection power in his hands. When you ascribe to God that resurrection power, then you'll praise God for Jesus. For in Christ Jesus, we have the power to stand for justice. And in Christ Jesus, we have the power to flip tables of exploitation. And in Christ Jesus, we have the power to love our neighbors as ourselves. In Christ Jesus, we have the power to demonstrate love to the marginalized, to the left out, the left behind, the outcast, and the other. 
So when the psalmist says, oh, sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvelous things. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth, break forth in joyous song and sing praises. He doesn't say it and I don't say it so that there's noise in worship. We don't say sing unto the Lord a new song so there's new music for Elikam to teach. We don't say praise God in the sanctuary just so that we can have exuberant worship. The psalmist encourages praise and I encourage praise so that we can recall the deeds of God lest we think God is doing nothing so that we can give credit where credit is due and not where it's not. The psalmist, the scriptures, and I encourage praise so that we don't miss the praiseworthy, marvelous things that God has done and therefore think God is doing no I encourage praise so that we can acknowledge the most marvelous of God's deeds and that's the marvelous deeds of Jesus Christ who paid it all and laid the foundation for a life of justice and equity and abundance and love and simply told us to go and do likewise. This past week, I heard one of the best quotes I've ever heard in the convocation at McCormick. The speaker was quoting Jurgen Maltzman who said, nothing has to be put up with. And I ascribe that amazing truth to Jesus Christ and I ascribe it to God. Nothing has to be put up with. And without this wonderful, marvelous deed of God, his name is Jesus, the sweetest name I know. Without this marvelous deed of God, I shudder to think what life would be. But praise God. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah to your name for Jesus. God bless you.